everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is uh, December 21st, 2021, and in fact, it is going to be the last lecture of this year. And today we have with us Dr. Baljit Kaur, who is joining from UK, and she is consultant cellular pathologist and regional lead of gestational trophoblast pathology and malignant ovarian germ cell services at the Imperial College Health Care NHS Trust in London. And she would be delivering actually the 19th lecture in the GYN pathology lecture series. And the title of her talk today is going to be germ cell tumor of the ovary. And as always, please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat box on YouTube as well as Facebook. And we will be happy to pass them on to Dr. Kaur. And thank you, Dr. Kaur, for joining us today. Uh, over to you now. Thank you. And um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to come live on Pathcast. And this is uh, a brilliant platform. Uh, and I am so glad to be here. And hello to all the delegates and a very warm welcome. So I understand this is the last lecture of the series, so I'll try and do my best to make it of most educational value for all of you. Uh, what I'll do is I'll switch off my video now, just so that we can concentrate on the talk and this doesn't distract you. So, um, as Rafat said, I work at Imperial College London Hospital, um, which many of you might know is um, one of the very big centers for uh, trophoblastic diseases and also runs a centralized service for germ cell tumor. Um, I have no financial interests or conflicts to declare, uh, although I would say that for uh, part of this lecture, I have used some of the photographs from my two Bible books, which I really rely on. And um, so um, just to make it of more educational value, what I intend to do in this lecture is that I would provide you with a general overview of germ cell tumors first, then we would start talking about common types of germ cell tumor. Uh, and the concept about somatic malignancies and germ cell tumor would be dealt uh, depending on the time we have. Uh, uh, and then we would be talking about syndromes associated with malignant ovarian germ cell tumor. I have put various cases in between uh, our um, uh, talk today just to make it more interactive and interesting. So feel free to write your comments when we are going through those cases in the chat box and it would be nice to see what diagnosis is being said and we can talk about the differentials in the same format. In the last part of the lecture, I've kept a very interesting case, a unique case, first of its own kind, um, which we have published and it would be lovely to see if people can get that right and definitely that also depends on the time we have got. So quickly, um, starting with the part one of the lecture, which is general view on the over, uh, on the germ cell tumor. The, we are all aware of the latest WHO 2020, which has come out this year. And uh, it talks about the classification of germ cell tumor. And to the pathologists who are joining the forum today, I don't need to go through the classification, but just to say that we have five main types of tumors, the dysgerminomas, yolk sac, embryonal, and non-gestational choriocarcinoma, along with the teratomas. And then we have various mixed germ cell tumors, which can be formed as a combination of these tumor. We also have a list of monodermal teratomas, which can arise on background of these teratomas, and the mixed germ cell sex cord stromal tumors, which I would not be talking in today's talk. So, just a um, cartoon representation to say that ovaries has these germ cells which are destined to form mature eggs, but something goes wrong in the process and instead of forming an egg cell, these primordial germ cells, they undergo a lot of proliferation. There is no apoptosis or death of these tumor cells and they proliferate to re and result in a mass forming lesion. 
which will be uh, called a germ cell tumor. Coming to what goes wrong when what happens, which leads to these germ cell tumor, we know that the primordial germ cells are formed in the yolk sac and they migrate via hindgut to the gonadal ridge. During this process, their pluripotency factors are switched on and these, these are switched on and as when these cells reach the gonadal ridge, there is expression of dazzle, which kind of stops the expression of these pluripotency markers. Sorry. Oh. It ran really fast and we have come to quite the late end. So let me go back. So we were here. Right. So these pluripotency markers are switched off once Dazzle comes into play. And these are various pluripotency markers we have used in our arsenals of immunohistochemistry to kind of diagnose these germ cell tumors. We know about OCT4, SOX2, NanoG, and SAL4. And all of these factors are expressed by these pluripotent, by these pluripotent germ cells. And uh, expression of these is not switched off in cases of germ cell tumors resulting in excessive proliferation of these cells. Now, coming, if, if we look at the uh, initial model of how these germ cells originate, we know that there are primordial germ cells, which are totipotent cells. And if they do not differentiate, they can give rise to either dysgerminos, dysgerminomas or embryonal carcinomas, which are the most primitive form of germ cell tumor. Then these tumors, if they start differentiating along the embryonic cell lines, what we get is teratomas, which could be mature, immature, or monodermal. But if they start differentiating along extra embryonic cell lines, they can form either the placental tissue, which results in, uh, they can undergo placental differentiation, which will result in choriocarcinoma, or yolk sac differentiation, which will result in a yolk sac tumor. We know all the primordial germ cells express OCT34, SAL4, and NanoG. So the dysgerminoma express these markers. But once these cells start differentiating along embryonic cell lines, they will also start expressing SOX2, which is a marker of embryonal carcinoma and is also seen in the primitive neuroectoderm of immature teratoma. The the markers OCT4, SAL4, and NanoG, they are switched off once they start, the tumor starts differentiating. So these tumors will not express, the YST and Corio and Teratoma will not express the pluripotency marker, but instead they will express the marker like yolk sac would express SAL4 because this is when the tumor starts differentiating along the yolk sac line. So this is kind of a nice diagrammatic representation of how these pluripotency markers come into play uh, depending on which line this germ cell tumor is differentiating into and what germ cell tumor we are looking at. In addition, we know that LIN28 is a microRNA regulator, but this mark, this uh, particular uh, gene has got a role in causing increased proliferation and inducing pluri pluripotency within the stem cell progenitor cell. And it suppresses the um, kind of, it suppresses the differentiation of these cells. So if there's a mutation in LIN28 gene, what happens is it leads to proliferation of these stem cell progenitor cells. In addition, if there's a somatic tumor which shows this mutation, it can have this germ cell differentiation. So a somatic malignancy can look like uh, having a germ cell differentiation uh, if there is a mutation here. So just keep that in mind once we are looking at somatic tumors with germ cell uh, differentiation. So if we start thinking of diagnosing malignant ovarian germ cell tumor down the microscope and throwing a lot of our arsenal of immunocytochemistry and working at the molecular of these, 
the first thing we need to know is, uh, as with any other tumor, half of your diagnosis comes before you start looking at these things down the microscope. So the age, the gross appearance of the tumor, and any biological activity or the serum markers, if you know of those, you can achieve your diagnosis. You can narrow down your diagnosis and reach at right differentials before you start looking down the microscope. And this is a general rule in pathology that a lot of it is derived from this part of the chart. And the diagnostic approach, <clears throat> Sorry, the diagnostic approach, as with any other clinical, uh, as with any other tumor in pathology, you would first look at the clinical setting, the macro appearance of the tumor, and then we go down to microscopy, looking at the various growth patterns, cell types, and finally using panel of immunocytochemistry, depending on what we are seeing and what is our differential. So the pre-morphological features, which are really important in uh, when we are looking at any ovarian germ cell tumor is the age of the patient. And it's very important to know that if a tumor is present in a female who's less than 30 years of age, 75% of the time, it's going to be a germ cell tumor. So it's very important to look at this factor and say, uh, what is the age of my patient and what is the most important differential I should be considering here? So 75% of the time, it would be germ cell. Next 10% could be sex cord stromal or surface epithelial tumor. And then we have heterogeneous group of tumors, which could include Krukenberg's metastatic tumors, um, uh, which can occur in young age or leukemia, lymphoma, and things like that, which are really rare. The second important thing is looking at the tumor markers. So ask your clinicians or look at if you can get the access to the history of the patient, what are the tumor markers? And it's important to see that as these tumors are very rapidly dividing and mitotically very active and the proliferation is really high in these tumor, they, uh, these tumor are characterized by increased LDH uh, most of the times. And if the tumor is yolk sac tumor or an embryonal tumor, it's got, it will have an increased AFP. It can also be seen with immature teratomas and again with mixed tumors. HCG could be raised in choriocarcinomas, but these are not the only ones. Embryonal carcinomas or embryonal tumors, which can also show um, rise of HCG levels and uh, around 5% of dysgerminomas can see HCG levels which are high, but these are usually not that high as seen with choriocarcinomas or embryonal tumors. And again, mixed tumors can have any kind of um, combination of uh, these um, markers. So the marker status is not only useful for diagnosis of the patient, but one has to remember that once the initial surgery has been done and the debulking has been done or the primary tumor has been resected, it's also important to monitor the response to the therapy and post-treatment surveillance using these markers. The next important factor we always say in pathology, gross is really an important parameter which one has to look and uh, any experienced histopathologist would say that going back to their macro specimen helps them so many times then it or nearly the same times as getting levels or ancillary stains so for the germ cell tumors most of these tumors are usually large and um, depending on the type of the tumor you can have a different uh, macroscopic appearance. We all know, we all have seen teratomas, which we can easily kind of um, diagnose on the gross appearances. These can have that sebaceous grimace material with hair, um, the cheesy material. So it's really easy to spot that. But if there are any 
cysts or any solid nodules within the teratoma, please sample them uh, and uh, look at them. If you see that the tumor has got a hemorrhagic or necrotic area or purplish area, please sample those areas as those could be areas of choriocarcinomatous differentiation. Any areas with a mixture of small and large cysts, like a microcystic sponge-like appearance, that could represent part of the yolk sac tumor. While dysgerminomas are usually solid, fleshy, and homogeneous tumors with very limited hemorrhage, necrosis, or degeneration, although they can show that. So what is really important in the macro, it's just not seeing what is there, but also sampling them and sampling the different areas adequately with these germ cell tumors, because we do not stop at one diagnosis here. We can have a combination. So again, sampling is really important. And again, I have one, one thing which I always would like to highlight is that this is one tumor where we would like to sample even the necrotic areas, because what you can see at the rim of the necrotic areas are areas of embryonal, carcin or embryonal tumor or choriocarcinoma. So really important to sample even the necrotic bits. Coming to the general features of um, the germ cell tumors, we all know they are derived from primitive germ cells of the embryonic gonad. So they can occur along the line of migration of primitive germ cells. So you can just not see these tumors within the gonads, but also in the retroperitoneum, mediastinum, uh, in the central nervous system, in the pineal gland. So um, all of those areas. And most of the time, the tumor is unilateral. They are seen in young patients within the reproductive age group, and they are characterized by uh, their um, serum markers. They demonstrate biological activity because of excess of endogenous hormone production. And the good thing about these tumors is that the prognosis of most of these tumors is really good. And with the current chemotherapy, a 90 to 95% cure rate has been achieved, and this is uh, really commendable uh, because given the fo uh, very fast multiplication of these tumors and that they occur in young reproductive age group patients, the chemotherapy response or the treatment response is amazing. So how do they present? These patients would usually present with abdominal pain or a mass lesion in 85% of the cases, but in 10% of the cases, what we can see is acute symptoms in form of, I'm so sorry, this keeps. So in 10% of the patient, we see acute symptoms in form of torsion or hemorrhage. And uh, at times these patients can present with false positive pregnancy tests due to HCG production uh, and also result in menstrual irregularities or isosexual precocity. So these are the steps or these are the initial things we look at before peeping down our microscopes. What are the things which would help us to make the diagnosis of germ cell tumor down the microscope? So important thing is to remember that what we are looking at at down the microscope is very primitive cells. And these cells are very large. So if we compare to a lymphocyte down here, the cell is at least four times, three to four times the size of lymphocyte. In fact, the nucleolus can fit the size of the lymphocyte nucleus. So these are very, very large cells with very prominent cherry red nucleoli most of the time in most of the tumors. Um, and they look quite big and angry. And these cells will have a lot of mitotic activity and um, apoptosis going on. And some of the tumors will have certain classical features like Schiller dual bodies or hyaline globules um, or other architectural features which will help you to make the diagnosis. So it's 
really nice to remember that the ovaries with these tumor look really angry. It's those big cells you are looking at with very prominent nucleoli, which are uh, which will help you to narrow down your differentials to only few tumors. Coming to common type of germ cell tumors, and what I would do with this part of the talk is to go over some cases with you. And um, what, please feel free to write your diagnosis in the chat, although I cannot monitor the chat at the moment, I've not kept it open, but it would be nice to see what people come up with their diagnosis. So case one, 25 years old female, left ovarian tumor, which is 18 centimeters in size. Patient has raised LDH. We haven't been provided with other markers on this patient. And this is the low power view of the tumor. What you can see is that the ovary is replaced by this tumor, which is usually in form of sheets. And somewhere here, there are a few cords of tumor. And on a higher part, these are bigger, big looking cells. You can see that there is, some of them are in cords, nests and sheets. They are separated by fibrous bands. And with these fibrous bands, there's a sprinkle of lymphocytes. And on further higher part, there, these cells have got very large vesicular nucleus, prominent nucleolus, mitotic activity here. And the cells are quite well separated. They have these eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. They are very well separated. The nuclei are respecting each other boundaries. They are not overlapping. And this is a stain uh, on immunohistochemistry, the leukocyte common antigen at the low par. You can see there are lots of cells staining up for leukocyte common antigen, but when you go on a higher par, the big tumor cells are negative, and this is picking up the lymphoid population within the tumor. And when you stain this tumor with OCT3-4, the tumor cells are beautifully coming up, so you can see the contrasting pattern of LCA versus OCT3-4. So, I hope you would have got your diagnosis here. And this is the CD117 stain, which is beautifully membranous, highlighting the nuclear membranes. So the diagnosis here for many of you who might have already got it is dysgerminoma. So dysgerminoma is one of the most common malignant germ cell tumors of the ovary. It usually occurs in children and young women, mostly uh, age group is uh, average age is 22 years. And many of these patients, a uh, proportion of these patients may have gonadal dysgenesis, especially if you see this tumor originating on the background of gonadoblastoma, you should question if this patient has gonadal dysgenesis. LDH is often elevated, and as I said, 3 to 5% can have modest elevation of HCG. Some of these patients can present with hypercalcemia. Again, this would be important because uh, uh, the tumor which may fall in your differential on the basis of clinical is that young patient who's of reproductive age with a big ovarian mass and presenting with hypercalcemia, another tumor which you might want to think of in your differential before you start looking at the slide, and which can also partially come in the differential of, uh, in the microscopy is small cell hypercalcemic time. So uh, please remember that this tumor can also give rise to hypercalcemia. And on GROSS, we actually discussed that the tumor is usually fleshy, tan, homogeneous, and uh, uh, there are very few areas of degeneration or necrosis within the tumor. Microscopy, I have already demonstrated with my case. Again, these can have clear cytoplasm. My case had more, more of eosinophilic cytoplasm. Tumor cells respecting each other's boundaries, important because embryonal carcinoma, when I show you that, 
uh, that is one tumor where the tumor ce cells can look very much similar to this germinoma, but they look much more bizarre and they do not respect each other's boundaries. So there's no squaring of nuclei or no, this ample cytoplasm separating um, these nuclei. And this uh, uh, clear cytoplasm, we, this shows pass positivity and it's d pass sensitive and it also picks up the lipid stains. What is important is that fixation can have a massive effect if the tumor is too big and has not been cut, not been sliced into and is not properly fixed. What at times you can see is that the cytoplasm shrinks and um, uh, these, this tumor can look very much like a lymphoma. And if you put an LCA stain, but do not put the right a pluripotency marker or a CD117, you may get your diagnosis wrong. So uh, in areas of where it's not properly fixed, uh, this morphology can be very much altered. Also, another time you would want to see is that if the tumor has got lots of granulomatous inflammation or more component of the inflammatory cells and very few tumor cells, you might have to really kind of hunt for these cells and maybe throw in immunocytochemistry to pick these ones up uh, because it could so much mimic granulomatous inflammation, granulomatous oophoritis that these tumor cells can be missed. So remember that as a variation in morphology. And at times you can see these sensitive trophoblast type cells within the dysgerminoma component. Here there is no mixed tumor component. These trophoblastic cells which stain up 4-HCG may be present in the middle of this germinoma. And this is known, as I said, in around 5% of this germinomas. And this can be responsible for HCG production within this tumor. So the immunocytochemistry panel, which will be very helpful in making the right diagnosis and excluding the differentials. As we said, these tumors can show uh, plaque positivity, which can be cytoplasmic and membranous. Then there are a few membranous markers, which can help you CD117 and D240. And the pluripotency marker, which will pick up the nuclear stain can also be very helpful. CKIT mutation has been uh, shown to occur in a third of cases of dysgerminoma. And although we do not use targeted therapy for CKIT because these tumors are very much chemosensitive and radiosensitive, which is a better line of management for these patients. The differential diagnosis, uh, other germ cell tumors, which we will be talking about may come into differential here. Uh, like embryonal and yolk sac and mixed germ cell tumor. But in addition, uh, within the differential can come somatic malignancies like clear cell carcinoma, although the age group will be completely different. And these tumors will be cytokeratin CK7 and EMA positive and not positive for the pluripotency markers because of the very um, uh, clear cytoplasm, which, is sta which stains up for lipid stains as well. It might be confused with steroid cell tumor, but again, you know the markers are, are for steroid cell tumors are completely different. And in the same way, lymphoma and melanoma can come into differential uh, uh, as we have seen earlier. One has to remember though, that melanoma can show positivity with CD117, although that is cytoplasmic positivity and not membranous positivity. But if that is in your uh, differential, please put up a wider panel rather than just using CD117. Um, this is actually more of a general feature with all the germ cells that the spread could be local either because of rupture or uh, it's just going transperitoneal. And metastasis is more prominently lymphatic than via hematogenous route. So this is in general for all of the germ cell tumors. Coming to our next case, we have a 13 years old female with left ovarian tumor. This is an eight centimeter tumor. Um, and what I'm showing you is only part of the tumor here. And this tumor has got very necrotic appearance, as you can see. And then there are these 
sheets of tumor cells with a kind of clefting in between or a vague glandular kind of arrangements and sheets. And you can easily see that this tumor, even at this power, looks more pleomorphic and has got some big cells in between. On a higher power, these, this is the appearance. And you can see you have these cells, which are again, very large in appearance in contrast to inflammatory cells, which might be here. And they have got very prominent nucleoli, angry looking nucleoli, and they have got more basophilic kind of cytoplasm or amphophilic cytoplasm. And there are no clear boundaries. The nuclei are quite overlapping. They are not respecting each other's boundaries. The tumor looks much more angry. And there is more mitosis and lots of necrosis in between this tumor. And the higher power view, again, you can see that there are a few multinucleate cells in between this tumor. And the tumor is much more pleomorphic and more mitotically active. This is a broad spectrum cytokeratin stain with the tumor. You can see the tumor is beautifully positive for a 13 Further stains on this tumor, it shows nuclear um, positivity with OC3-4. The tumor shows membranous positivity with CD30. And some of the bigger cells in between are positive with HCG. And I have to say that this was not the only component of the tumor. This was only part of this tumor. We also had components uh, like um, dysgerminoma and YSD and choriocarcinoma within this tumor. So some of you who might have got this already right, this was a case of embryonal carcinoma. And as from our initial chart, we learned that this is one of the least differentiated form of germ cell tumor. Um, and it's, it really occurs as a pure entity. It's usually uh, in combination that we see. And in the ovaries, this is much more uncommon than in the testicular germ cell tumor. Uh, it usually occurs in children and young adults. And again, these patients uh, may have dysgenic gonads and can be seen in association with gonadoblastoma. The tumor, uh, the patients may present with false positive pregnancy tests because as we saw, this tumor can have a component of syncytiotrophoblast type giant cells within them. Um, on microscopy, we saw that these tumor cells have got this very angry looking uh, cells with um, tumor cells, they may be arranged in solid sheets most of the time. And at other times, they may have these what we call as gland like appearance with these slit like or cleft like spaces between the solid islands, giving them a vague glandular arrangement. And also, they can have these syncytiotrophoblast type giant cells within the tumor. In contrast to dysgerminoma, these tumors are uh, positive for, sorry. In contrast to dysgerminomas, these tumors are positive for low molecular weight cytokeratin. Uh, and in addition, they are also positive for CD30, which we saw the membranous staining. EMA is usually negative and they show expression of pluripotency marker. And because this is differentiating also along embryonal cell lines, there is SOX2 expression within these tumors. Depending on um, uh, whether they have syncytotrophoblast type component, they can show HCG positivity. AFP is usually negative, but may be positive in these tumors. Most of the time, these tumors may show isochromosome 12B or abnormalities of uh, chromosome 12 uh, on fish. The differential diagnosis, again, is mostly with the other types of germ cells like this germinoma, yolk sac, or choriocarcinoma. But as you have seen with the slit like uh, cleft like spacing and very high grade looking nucleoli, it could also be confused with high grade epithelial carcinomas such as serous carcinomas. But again, the age group 
will tell you that this is a wrong setting. And as we said, most of the time, embryonal is not there as a pure component. You would usually see it as a mixture with other germ cell tumors. This tumor has a, a highly uh, aggressive behavior and it spreads extensively within the abdominal cavity and usually metastasizes early. Coming to case three, we have got a 23 years old female with a right ovarian tumor, which is 13 centimeters. I'm not providing you with the serum markers because we do not want to make it too simple. So at the very low par, what we can see with this tumor is that it has got lots of different patterns going on. So at places we have very solid appearing tumor, then we have got it as some kind of little papillary arrangement, then we have got lots of myxoid look to the tumor in between with cords of tumor cells traveling. And at places we have got this little fenestrated look or kind of microcystic appearance to this tumor. On a high power, I will show you the various patterns. So here you can see that the tumor has got a bit of trabecular arrangement and some glandular arrangement with some kind of supranuclear vacuolations. Here it has got a bit of more myxoid look to it. Here you can see it's kind of trying to form some vague Schiller dual bodies, though they are not really the good ones to demonstrate Schiller dual, and I'll show you that later. And you have got some sieve like architecture in between. And here we have got a more solid appearing tumor with little spaces and a way glandular arrangement as well. On immunocytochemistry, this tumor is positive for AFP. And again, this was another area of that micro uh, kind of cystic appearance, microcystic appearance here. And this tumor is, shows beautiful positivity for SAL4 and glipicin 3 So I hope we have got the diagnosis in the chat, which I'm not able to monitor, but this is an example of yolk sac tumor. And this is a photograph from WHO 2014, which showed um, that kind of the, the, the start of this tumor entity described that it has got various patterns and depending on which line this is differentiating into, uh, we know that yolk sac tumor can differentiate along enteric lines, can differentiate along hepatic cell lines. So it can show various patterns and various, it can show even endometrial patterns. So uh, the, the myriad of pattern this tumor has kind of makes it very unique and special amongst this germ cell tumors, because it can really be the most difficult tumor to diagnose if you are not sampling it well, but if you have sampled it well, the kind of patterns tell you really the diagnosis uh, and it may be very obvious. So yolk sac tumor, which had also been called as endodermal sinus tumor is more common in, again in children and young women, although some of the tumors have been diagnosed uh, in uh, women more than 50. Uh, and we know that whenever you're diagnosing it in, a, in that age group, please exclude a somatic malignancy with a yolk sac differentiation, which we will be talking about later. So this tumor usually presents with a high AFP, high CA125, and um, along with the gonadal locations, as we have seen, many of these tumors, the germ cell tumors, can also present in extra gonadal locations. As we said, there are various growth patterns, the most common one being the microcystic pattern seen here and the endodermal sinus or the festooning pattern. But in addition, we have got all of these patterns, which I'm just quickly uh, kind of demonstrating here. This is the beautiful Chilla dual body, not my case. It's a photograph from uh, one of my Bible books, which I have said. And, um, also showing here the uh, eosinophilic globules, then the myxoid pattern here, and this one showing the glandular pattern. 
here is an example of hepatoid pattern and please make sure that the hepatoid carcinoma which can also occur in uh, the elderly females is uh, ruled out that this is not a part of any somatic malignancy this is the more solid appearance here you have got the vitiline appearance or uh, the uh, where the, you have got macrocystic appearance Sometimes these tumor can produce past positive basement membrane-like material, which is called as the parietal pattern, and that can also be seen in these tumors. At times, they can have the very glandular appearance, and this could be intestinal type with goblet cells in between, uh, and these tumors can show CDX2 positivity. Uh, or you can have the endometrial type glandular pattern where you have supranuclear and subnuclear vacuoles. Um, and although we use AFP as the most common stain, uh, uh, we have been using AFP. AFP can be very focal and uh, it, could, it may not be seen in um, a large part of the tumor. You have to uh, do the stain on two or three or four blocks to find out focal expression of this uh, um, in uh, multiple blocks. But now we can use sulfur and glipican to actually help us um, with highlighting of this tumor. So he, these tumors are positive for uh, low molecular weight cytokeratins or broad spectrum cytokeratins, but they are usually CK7 negative. They can show very focal CK7 expression. Um, and they are usually negative for EMA. They are positive with SAL4, glipican 3 and uh, negative for other pluripotency markers. And as we have said, they can show cytoplasmic staining for AFP. LIN28 can be positive in these. We do not have this antibody, but because this is now in recent WHO 2020, I have included that in my chart, but I have no experience with this antibody. Now, since this tumor has got variety of histological patterns, you would assume that the differential diagnosis for this tumor is really, really wide because you have not only somatic malignancies like clear cell carcinoma in your differential, you have other um, germ cell tumors. The solid component of yolk sac tumor can look like this germinoma and embryonal carcinoma, but you also have sex cord stromal tumor, juvenile granulosa cell within the differential because this is again the tumor of young uh, age group females and uh, can present with that broad macrocystic uh, kind of appearance or microcystic appearance, making it very confusing and um, uh, bringing the differential diagnosis of juvenile granulosa cell tumor. So I'm not going to go through these immuno panels in detail, but we have already talked about what are the antibodies which would help you to make this diagnosis. And here I have produced some charts for you to throw in the right panel of when you are considering the various kinds of tumor in your differential. The important thing I would like to talk about is that yolk sac tumor not only has different morphological patterns, it can throw in more confusing stuff at you and can cause more diagnostic difficulties. For example, it can be associated with extramedullary hematopoiesis, and you can see that going on within the tumor. The stromal cells in this tumor can differentiate into mesenchymal elements like cartilage or muscle and bone, and you may start thinking that there's a teratoma component, but please remember that these there will be only mesenchymal elements but if you see ectodermal or endodermal elements, they are genuine teratoma. But if you are seeing just mesenchymal elements like uh, your um, Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, this can differentiate into, uh, this can show heterologous differentiation into mesenchymal elements. Then you, we will be talking about this entity later, epithelial carcinomas with YST. So when you are seeing this yolk sac tumor in the wrong age setting, please, do wider sampling and exclude that there is no component of somatic malignancy in the background. And sometimes YST can overgrow somatic malignancy. So you have to hunt for these elements if you are having a tumor in the wrong age group setting. 
coming to the most common, and I think this will be like a little break after this um, uh, heavy talk about the initial entities. So mature teratoma, we can all switch off for a little while. We all know about this, not a big deal. Um, this is one tumor that can occur bilaterally in five to 10 percent cases, in addition to this germinoma, which can occur bilaterally. Most of the other germ cell tumors are unilateral. Um, and uh, I don't think I need to talk much. The one thing which I like to highlight is that these are most commonly seen in age group of 20 to 50. If you are seeing a teratoma in a postmenopausal woman, please make sure you don't miss any unusual findings there. Uh, most of the time it's asymptomatic, can present as acute symptoms or as paraneoplastic encephalitis. Again, we will be talking about this in the syndromes associated with germ cell tumors. So gross, we are all aware, and um, sorry about that. Microscopic features, we are all aware, so I would skip that and I would come to my case here. So in this case, what we can see is the elements from, so we have some, got some squamous elements here. We have got, I was looking for my laser mouse. Okay, so we've got some squamous elements, we've got cartilage, we have got some endodermal glandular elements. And we have got a bit of um, choroid plexus here and here. And what we can see is some of these hyperchromatic areas in between what we would have thought to be a teratoma. And looking down at a higher part here, that is a normal choroid plexus. Again, that is important that sometimes I find that with my registrars that the choroid plexus, they haven't seen that florid at times and uh, that could be confused. So remember that's an element of mature teratoma here. But on here, what we can see is these very primitive appearing cells, which are in form of little rosettes and hyperchromatic blue cells. Um, and um, these are mitotically active and you can see very cellular glare in the background here. So this will be an immature teratoma. And over here, I am just showing a spectrum. In this case, there are very few elements of immaturity here. And this is my next case. And what we can see in this case is very primitive appearing glare, some cartilage, which is very primitive appearing. And then we see these areas of immature neuroepithelial tubules, more of tubules and um, rosettes here. And there is quite a bit of that. And it's not only these, but in addition, what we have, these blue appearing areas, is these neuroblast-like cells, which are present in these primitive glia. So all of this is a component. You can see quite a prominent component of immature neuroepithelium here in this case five. And with the case six, what I want to show is that this is only focal areas of these tubules or rosettes, more of rosettes here. And then most of it is in form of sheets like neuroblast-like appearance. And when you see too much of this neuroblast, uh, the books describe this as a one centimeter cutoff. But what I've seen, if you are seeing these solid sheets of neuroblast, a lot of them, you, you would want to think of like a peanut-like component within that immature teratoma. And prognosis with the patients who have this peanut-like component, it records in my experience, I have had four or five cases and this tumor has always come back. So immature teratoma is an uncommon tumor and it comprises less than 1% of the teratomas of the ovary. It's most commonly seen in first two decades. And so usually your patient would be a, ch a child or a young adult. And what we are wanting to see is the mixture of mature and immature tissues 
Um, and the key component is this immature neuroectoderm. We are not relying on immature mesenchyme, immature cartilage to make this diagnosis. What we definitely need is the immature neuroectoderm, which can be form of which can be in form of these rosettes, tubules, or this neuroblast-like appearance. And what is important is that we grade these tumors and the grading system, uh, what we definitely would use in UK is the three tier system uh, where you have grade one, when you can see these immature neuroepithelium in less than one low power field um, or equal to one low power field. When this is two or three low power fields, it's grade two. And when you see it in more than or equal to four low power fields, it's grade three. Some people would like to use two tier system where grade one is the low grade and two and three are considered as high grade. And what I would want to say over here is that with mature teratomas, uncommonly, but more commonly with mature teratomas, you can see these implants within, sorry. Oh, God. You can see these implants in the omentum, which are composed of glial tissue and does have some bit of neurons within it. Uh, very bland appearing. And this is what we call as glial implants. And if there are too many of them within the momentum, you call it as gliomatosis, although they are more of neural implants uh, than just glia. Um, and these are also graded uh, depending on their cellularity and the vascular proliferation and the mitotic activity. And grade zero glial implants have no prognostic significance, although this would make this as a stage three tumor, but has no prognostic in, uh, implications and the chemotherapy uh, decisions are not altered based on these grade zero implants. Coming to the next category, which is secondary neoplasm in malignant teratoma. Most of the times the malignant, uh, sorry, in mature teratomas, not malignant teratomas, sorry about that. So mature teratomas, uh, we all have seen many of them, but rarely uh, in around um, 0.2 to 1.4% of the cases, they can have malignant transformation. And again, this usually occurs in postmenopausal women. And this is another tumor which can present with hypercalcemia. Uh, the most common tumor which can arise on background of mature teratoma is uh, squamous cell carcinoma or SCC. And if that's the case, we might see SCC antigen to be elevated. So this is a list of all the neoplasm, but you can see the teratoma can be composed of any element. And similarly, it could have benign or malignant part, counterpart of any of those components which can uh, which can present as a tumor. So this is one of my cases, and this is a mature teratoma. And what you can see here is some nests of very pigmented cells. And you can see these nests are like what you see junctional nests with some dropping of pigment. And this was a benign nevus originating on background of mature teratoma. It wasn't a malignant melanoma. It was shown to dermatopathologists and they were very happy and we were all happy. This is a benign nevus arising on background of mature teratoma. This is another case. And you can see that there is teratoma with fat and mesenchyme and we have some irregular islands of very eosinophilic cells within this tumor. And on higher par, they show definite squamoid differentiation. And this is a case of squamous cell carcinoma arising on background of mature teratoma. I have all these cases in my software, which is open just on the side. And I'm just trying to project the photographs because it makes, because I know the lecture is big. And I would want to get, go through as many cases as possible. But if anyone is interested in seeing the live cases, I do have those and we can go over those uh, at the end. This is another case, which is uh, showing this epithelium, which looks like CIN3. And then there's this, uh, there's this 
infiltration into the underlying stroma. And at places, it looked very much transitional, but had definite square more differentiation. It was P63 positive, GATA3 negative. And this is another case of um, mature teratoma. You can see the teratomatous elements here, and then something happening here and here, which is not right. On higher par, you have this definite squamous differentiation with these keratin pearls, but there are also some glands within this tumor, definite glandular arrangement going on and something which looks like gland with squamous elements possibly. So I've tried to photograph that, that's your squamous element. And then you have some glandular components and then you have some elements like that where there's a mixture of cells cell types like here. And this is similar to one of the salivary gland neoplasms you would have seen. So please feel free to type your diagnosis in the chat. This is ABD pass staining and you can see that there's definite mucin. So this is the squamous component and there is your glandular components. And some of these have definite mucin within them. The others are more kind of intermediate type. So the diagnosis here is mucoepidermoid carcinoma arising on background of mature teratoma. And this is, I, when I searched last, this was the seventh case in the literature, only six of these have been reported. So a very nice case here. And just to talk about the somatic malignancies of mainly squamous cell carcinoma arising on background of mature teratoma. This is a lovely paper where uh, Prof. Navina Singh and Ian McNeish are involved. Um, um, and what I would want to say about this, that SCC in all of these cases, in all of this series where they were HPV negative, they show high mutational burden and specifically lots of uh, P53 uh, mutation in these tumor, but the mutation in P53 was associated with better survival. And many of these patients, they benefited from immune checkpoint inhibitor. So uh, really, really nice paper to have a read. And then I come to my case 10, which is another amazing case. And this patient is again young. She was 29 years old and she presented with a large ovarian mass. And when we started looking at the ovarian mass, there were different morphologies in different sections. So there was a very, very small component, which was a mature teratoma. Then we had this very necrotic tumor, which had this kind of arrangement. You can see some glands with large areas of necrosis in between. On higher par, these are glands lined by tall columnar cells. They have got some goblet cells in between, some mucin, and they have areas of necrosis within the glands. And they had a bit of that garland-like appearance. So higher power view of these glands, definite beautiful glands, lots of mitotic activity. These glands were positive for CK20. They were negative with CK7 beautiful CK20 staining, and they were also positive with CDX2. They were negatively staining for AFP, SAL4, and glipokin 3 The other part of the tumor had a morphology like this, which is a very solid appearance. And on a higher par, if you look, this has got that sieve-like pattern with microcystic appearance and lots of eosinophilic globules within the tumor. Here we have them in higher power. And you can see that these are just not eosinophilic. You have some got some more amphiphilic as well. So this part of the tumor had got has ha, has a very strong expression of AFP and glipokin 3. So diagnosis in this tumor would be, this is a mixed tumor. It's basically a teratoma with yolk sac, which has also got a somatic malignancy, which has got a malignancy within it, which is arising from the uh, 
the glandular epithelium of the teratoma. And here there is a mucinous carcinoma or a colorectal type malignancy arising on background of mature teratoma and YST. We recommended this patient have a MDT discussion and a thorough look at her colorectum and all of the GI tract. There was no primary tumor in the GI tract. And you can see that the tumor is confined just to the ovary. The patient hasn't recurred. She has responded very well to the uh, germ cell chemotherapy regimen. Coming to the next category, which is of monodermal teratomas, I'm not going to talk about this in detail. Um, and uh, we have lots of tumors in this category, which include PNET. Uh, we can have glio gliomas, glioblastomas, ependymomas, truma ovari, carcinoid tumors, and strumal carcinoid tumors. We will just run through a few pictures of these. And here you can see a peanut-like arrangement. This is an ependymoma. Again, these are not my cases. These are borrowed pictures. And this is a struma, a, a, a very proliferative struma over eye, uh, which looks like a follicular carcinoma, but it is not. It's just a proliferative struma over eye. And this is a papillary carcinoma arising on background of um, uh, struma ovari. Diagnostic problems with these cases, with the case of this is basically, uh, we are talking about immature teratomas here. Uh, you can confuse the rosettes and tubules with the ependymal tubules, which are very bland looking. They are not stratified. They are mitotically inactive. And um, uh, I usually find SOX2 and MIB1 staining very helpful in these cases. But morphology is always, always the key. Not each and every mature teratoma will have beautiful SOX2 staining and may not be that actively uh, seen to be actively proliferating on MIB1. We do have exceptions and I've seen a few of those. Uh, cerebellar type tissue, glial tissue, fetal type cartilage, they can all mimic and uh, one might uh, confuse them and cause, uh, this can cause confusion for immature teratoma. And uh, please remember that carcinosarcomas can have heterologous differentiations and they can have germ cell patterns and these can cause confusion with the immature teratomas. Coming to the last category, which is choriocarcinoma. Choriocarcinoma rarely occurs again as a primary tumor itself. It's usually in combination. Whenever we are seeing choriocarcinoma in an ovary, please, please, please remember that there are multiple settings uh, in which a choriocarcinoma can arise. And diagnosing the setting right is very important because these patients have different treatment and different prognosis. So. A choriocarcinoma in an ovary could be a primary gestational choriocarcinoma where the tumor has originated in the uterus and uh, has either metastasized to the ovary or is primary gestational within the ovary. So these are the first two settings we are talking about of gestational choriocarcinoma. The second category is choriocarcinoma arising on a background of germ cell tumor. All these three categories will occur in young patients, reproductive age group, but the prognosis is different. So here you, you will usually see other uh, type of uh, germ cell tumor elements in the background. The last category is choriocarcinoma arising in somatic malignancy. So we have seen cases of serous carcinoma and of other types of uh, epithelial malignancies with choriocarcinomatous differentiation. And uh, these are HCG positive. The serum may be having HCG within it, but usually much modest levels as compared to primary gestational choriocarcinomas. And what you will find with further sampling is a somatic malignancy in the background. Um, so a choriocarcinoma can occur in all of these settings. And why it is important to get that diagnosis right is, sorry, I think I'll skip this and come to this chart first. Because a gestational choriocarcinoma has got an excellent prognosis. We have a 99% cure rate of these tumors with very simple chemotherapy regimens like methotrexate or EMACO. Whereas a non-gestational tumor requires platinum-based chemotherapy. And although a germ cell tumor 
if it is arising on the background of germ cell tumor and if it is confined to the ovary, it can have a good prognosis of about 90%. But if it is arising on the background of somatic malignancy, this has got a very, very worse prognosis. And why it is important to make this diagnosis is because of these reasons. Your chemotherapy regimens will depend on it. The prognosis depends on it. And if the sampling is the one which will give you most of the answers, but if you're not finding the answer through sampling, we go for uh, uh, molecular genotyping using um, the DNA sequencing. And this will show the maternal and paternal components in the gestational choriocarcinoma. That means half of the tumor component DNA would be arising uh, will be having foreign chromosomes to the background. So it might have a Y chromosome or it might it will have a half set of chromosomes which do, do not belong to the patient. So that is how we make that diagnosis. And what I have missed here, I'll just go back. So choriocarcinoma is a biphasic tumor and it has got uh, mononuclear elements closely admixed with these uh, multinucleate cells, which are kind of... Um, uh, they are kind of protecting or forming a garland around these mononuclear cells, which, which we say a typical bilaminar pattern. Um, and there's usually lots of hemorrhage and necrosis within the tumor. The tumor cells express HCG. In addition, they would express inhibin, GATA3, CD10, MELCAM or MCAM, whatever you may want to call them, or CD114, um, CD144, and they would also express beta HCG and in some cases HPL. So this is the immunocytochemistry panel, which we use for making that diagnosis. And in the interest of time, I would quickly move um, just to say the genetic landscape of gestational of uh, germ cell tumor, KIT remains the most significantly mutated gene in these tumors, in addition to KRAS mutation. And most of these tumors will not have P53 mutation. So a lovely paper, again, a very good read. Then we come to mixed germ cell tumor. Mixed germ cell tumors are not uncommon. And depending on the series you look at, it would be five to 20% of all malignant germ cell tumors. And because uh, they, depending on the component, you will see different levels of biological markers, which would be elevated. And this is our data, which we presented in the recent European Congress of Pathology. And uh, um, this is the cases which uh, I have reported. And in the last nine years, we have seen 996 ovarian germ cell tumors, including mature teratomas. These have been excluded here. So out of the 177 malignant germ cell tumors, which we diagnosed, uh, there were 23 which were mixed germ cell tumors. So it constitutes 13%, but this data was taken when the immature teratomas with minor yolk sac components we had excluded from the series. But the latest WHO says that any component of yolk sac should be reported as mixed germ cell tumor. So including those that would be around 23%. So um, clinical features is same as what we have talked about for others and um, macroscopic. We did say that mixed germ cell tumors will have variegated appearance. So sample, sample, sample. And I would sample these as one or maybe two blocks per 10 centimeter and always include necrotic areas also in my sampling. Uh, in the microscopic pathology, what you would see that most common element in the mixed germ cell is either dysgerminoma and YST, followed by immature teratoma, choriocarcinoma, and embryonal carcinoma. And a significant proportion of these would show abnormalities of chromosome 12. So here we have an example of an immature teratoma. You can see beautiful neurotubules here, along with a yolk sac tumor with the macrocystic appearance. And this is a case where you see a dysgerminoma at the top with yolk sac tumor in this field. Uh, I'll come to my case 11. This is a lovely case actually on the live slides, but I would just do it on my selected photos. Um, what I have here is 
a tumor for you. And at the very low par, you can see that this tumor has a variegated pattern. In fact, this is slight cheating because I've included part of this tumor previously. Um, and this tumor is showing a pattern, one pattern here and a different pattern here. So coming first to this part, if you see this part has got these papillary areas, highline papillae, small ones, and these are lined by cells. And at high par, these are clear cells, hobnail appearance, and they have got these very hyalinized cores. They have got some eosinophilic globules. Happy for people to write their answers in the chat. And now we come to the second area, which is this bit. And this bit has got, we have already seen these pictures actually. So has got glandular appearance, has got this more trabecular appearance, has got these areas of very high grade nuclei, very pleomorphic with those big nucleoli. They were not seen in the first component. Again, some eosinophilic globules here and very clear cells. So the first part of the tumor, the arrow is wrong. This part of the tumor, if you see, is CK7 positive, whereas this part is completely negative for CK7. And the second part is very diffusely positive with AFP. And this part in here is completely negative for AFP. So the diagnosis is a yolk sac tumor arising on background of clear cell carcinoma. In fact, the live case shows endometriosis atypical endometriosis and also component of endometrioid carcinoma along with the clear cell carcinoma in this case. And I'm very happy to share those slides if anyone would be interested. So somatic malignancies in germ cell tumor is a recent recognition. And we are what we are recognizing is that some of the somatic, uh, the pluripotent cells, the pluripotent stem cells in the somatic neoplasms can differentiate along the germ cell phenotype. So these patients are usually uh, postmenopausal, middle-aged females. And my patient, which I just showed you with clear cell was a 56 years old lady. Um, and the, the pluripotent malignant stem cell can transform along the germ cell phenotype to give rise to these elements. And mostly we have seen yolk sac, but we have also seen other malignancies uh, like immature teratoma and even gonadoblastoma kind of appearance, but not true one um, in these. And this is the article which we published. And the case which I just showed you is a part of uh, this series, uh, which I submitted. And um, it kind of highlights that these, uh, this is a common pattern which we have seen that the malignancies arising on background of clear cell with yolk sac differentiation would show an overlap of features. And these tumors can uh, be nicely positive for SAL4 and villain. And for clear cell, napsin is a better marker because HNF1 beta can overlap with uh, the clear cell and the yolk sac components. So it will not help you in making the diagnosis right, but napsin would really be helpful. Sorry about that again. So coming to syndromes associated with malignant ovarian germ cell tumors, we have, we know that we talked about NT NMADR encephalitis, which is NT N methyl D aspartate encephalitis. And what happens here is that teratomas, which have got this glial component, uh, the glia expresses uh, this um, protein and the, there are antibodies targeted towards these protein, uh, which the body makes. And this is like an autoimmune disease phenomenon. Uh, and what this results is results in is the sudden onset encephalitis can occur in these patients and it can either manifest as prominent psychiatric symptoms or it can even lead to paraplegia and coma and seizures in these patients. The important thing to realize is that 
if you excise this teratoma and you give immunotherapy and steroids to this patient, this phenomenon can be completely reversible and it's such a dramatic response. So one should be aware of this type of encephalitis. And it's important that if you discuss these cases in the MDT, you recommend the removal of teratoma in these patients. Another syndrome which one might want to know about is the growing teratoma syndrome. And this usually occurs in patients with uh, germ cell tumors who have been treated with chemotherapy. And you might see in the imaging that there are growing masses within uh, the abdomen uh, in these patients. Uh, and although their serum markers are normal, there are these large masses within the abdomen. And uh, despite the chemotherapy or even after the co completion of chemotherapy. And when you resect these masses, what it shows is just the mature teratoma. And it has been increasingly recognized that uh, just growing teratoma syndrome, which was initially reported more in testis, is a phenomenon within the ovarian germ cell tumors as well. And awareness is important because you, what you need is not the chemotherapy because these are chemo uh, resistant and they would not respond to chemo, more chemotherapy. You need to excise these completely and the maximum debulk you receive, uh, you get from these patients will help with the better uh, life, uh, uh, would, would, help with this, uh, would help with the treatment of these patients. The next case, the next syndrome could be autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and it has been reported in patients with teratoma of ovaries, mainly mature cystic teratomas. Patients present with progressive anemia, elevated serum bilirubin, and positive Coombs test. And these patients do not respond to steroid therapy, but again, the excision of tumor would help with the disappearance of anemia in these young women. And uh, we also are aware of uh, the carcinoid syndrome, which can occur if the patient has a carcinoid arising on the background of uh, mature teratoma. So take home message is, um, I think we talked a lot, but what I would want you to remember most out of all the talk is this anti-NMGR encephalitis the use of pluripotency markers and how they are not just the surrogate markers for germ cell tumors. You can also see the expression in somatic malignancies with germ cell differentiation and why it is important to differentiate gestational versus non-gestational choriocarcinomas. And although we may just have talked about five tumors, a combination, multiple combinations of these tumors can occur and they can give rise to much weird combinations and a lot of diagnostic challenge. So unlike other, uh, and although we may just have talked about a combination, I'm sorry, I could hear myself there. So various combinations which can occur are these polyembryomas, mixed malignant germ cell tumors, germ cell sex cord tumors, and with epithelial malignancies. So I I'm happy if uh, people would want me to share the very interesting case, or I can take questions now. Rifat? Share the very interesting case. Rifat? Hello? Okay, so I've got a message to share my case, um, right? So we have got this 49 years old female. 
who presented with acute abdominal pain, raised C-reactive proteins, fever and vomiting in the ANA. And uh, CT scan showed a big adenexal mass, which was replacing the uterus, causing hydronephrosis. And an emergency leprotomy was performed for this patient. The tumor was received in multiple pieces, and you could see these hemorrhagic areas along with the uh, uh, more viable appearing tumor. So here we have a firm white tumor mass and more hemorrhagic areas. On microscopy, the tumor has got different appearances in uh, various slides. So a slide here shows that there are tiny glands with some kind of eosinophilic secretions within them. And on higher part, this is the appearance of these glands with these eosinophilic secretions our areas of kind of blood here. And the lining is very uniform, very monotonous. The nuclei are not high grade. They appear quite bland. There's not much mitotic activity in these areas. And these areas are sitting next to what is very similar to a benign counterpart here. Again, small ducts and tubules with these eosinophilic secretions within them. And this is the comparison of the more blander component, the benign component versus the more malignant component here. And in addition, it had this kind of ciliated lining, tubal type lining within the mass. This tumor is positive diffusely with CK7. It is positive with Pax8. There is kind of focal but strong staining with GATA3 and more widespread staining with TTF1 within the tumor. So if we have, we can type the diagnosis on this tumor. The second part of the same tumor showed areas which are having a variegated appearance again. So if we start from this end of the slide, the area looks like this. There's a very primitive glia with these hyperchromatic nuclei forming tubules and rosettes on one end. So here we have those. Then as we progress, we have these glandular appearing areas sitting next to those primitive glia. And these glandular areas have got a loose mesenchyme associated with them. And the third component of the tube, so this is the glandular component. This is mitotically active, very bizarre looking. And the third part of the component sitting next to the glandular element is these more solid appearing areas with very red kind of cytoplasm, very hyperchromatic nuclei overlapping with each other. And if we see a cytokeratin stain, it's only positive in part of the tumor, whereas most of that primitive glial appearing tumor is negative, the solid areas are negative, and part of that glandular component only is positive with broad spectrum cytokeratin. CK7 is completely negative, except for those little uh, cystic spaces lined by tubal type epithelium. Paxate is completely negative in this part of the tumor. You can see expression of SOX2 in the areas where this was showing the glial component with immature rosettes and in part in the solid component of the tumor. This is SAL4 expression, which you can see partly in the solid component and also in the glandular component of the tumor. And again, that's a higher power view of SAL4. And this is the glipican, which mirrors the SAL4 expression, except that it is negative in the solid part of the tumor. And those solid areas with overlapping nuclei, they show positive staining with CD30. That's a membranous CD30 staining. 
So we have two components here, the glandular and papillary component and the primitive appearing component. And the chart here kinds of highlights the various immunos that were done. And I've shown you only the relevant ones here. So any suggestion on the diagnosis of this tumor? So this one is a mixed mesonephric-like adenocarcinoma and malignant mixed germ cell tumor. The patient, as I told you, was 49. She had a widespread disease at the time of presentation. She was a stage three patient. And uh, um, this was managed as a somatic malignancy with germ cell differentiation. And uh, uh, she has recurred thrice uh, and still on treatment. So again, we have published this in American Journal of Surgical Pathology, along with Glenn um, as one of the co-authors. Um, and it's one of the unique case of its own kind. So I think I would end here and I'm happy to take the questions. I am not seeing Rifid appearing here. So I think I'll start reading the questions on the chat. Um, it says, uh -huh. given, are you here Rifid? Okay. Given the immuno panel done for case two that was positive for OCT4, CD30 and HCG, why not you consider mixed germ cell tumor rather than an embryonal carcinoma. So as I said, in that case, it was part of mixed germ cell tumor. I did comment on that. Uh, but just for that part, embryonal carcinoma can have uh, syncytiotrophoblast type giant cells within the tumor and can show HCG positivity in that part of the tumor. So if you're just seeing the embryonal component with OCT3, 4, CD30 positivity, and occasionally interspersed multinucleate cells, which are HCG positive, you would call it as an embryonal carcinoma and not called it as a choriocarcinoma because as for choriocarcinoma, I said, it has to have that typical bilaminar pattern of syncytiotrophoblastic cells along with the mononuclear cells uh, of cytotrophoblastic type, which show trophoblastic differentiation with GATA3 expression and mark, trophoblastic markers positive amongst those mononuclear cells. So I hope I have clarified that, but if not, please feel free to type in the chat. Uh, do you see, do you use SAL4 as a pangerm cell marker? Yes, a very good question. Yet SAL4 can work as a pangerm cell marker. It's very, um, uh, it's a pluripotency marker, which is expressed in nearly all germ cell components, so can be used as a pangerm cell marker. Can you explain how choriocarcinoma arise in somatic malignancy? Again, we address that, that some of the somatic malignant, the somatic malignancies, if they are very poorly differentiated, they can have these uh, pluripotent type stem cells within the malignant tumors. And this can differentiate as we see, as we saw in the original chart pattern, these can differentiate along any cell line. So if they start differentiating along the placental cell lines, they would form choriocarcinoma-like elements. And um, uh, this is known well-known with lung tumors, well-known with urothelial tumors, well-known with uh, tumors of GI tract and liver, and also now recognized with the gynae malignancies. 
in yolk sac tumors, if we see intestinal or endometrial glands, how can we differentiate it from malignant teratoma? Again, malignant teratoma, I do not know if we use that phrase anymore. Uh, we call it either teratoma with somatic malignancy in it, if you mean that, um, or we will think of a mixed germ cell tumor or a kind of, um, I think those are the only differentials I can get. So I do need a bit of clarification because malignant teratoma was term used in past, but I don't use that term anymore. And I don't think WHO recommends the term malignant teratoma. So uh, if you're using that, please, um, please comment on that and we can discuss that further. In reporting mixed germ cell tumor, is there a value in estimating the percentage proportion? Uh, so uh, that used to be a consideration again in the past, but now with the recent WHO, uh, they have kind of removed that percentage and they said any proportion is important and should be reported because it makes a difference. What if you don't have don't have immunocytochemistry? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very valid question. And I think, uh, most of the diagnosis with germ cell is morphological because you put up a panel depending on what you are seeing. And as I've demonstrated with multiple cases, there could be um, there could be lots of different patterns and you might have you immunocytochemistry is always helpful in confirming those patterns, uh, but it's not uh, really vital for making that diagnosis. Um, I mean, over here, we would definitely put immunocytochemistry um, in any case which has mixed pattern, a classical dysgerminoma. I wouldn't want to put immunocytochemistry if I'm happy making that diagnosis. A classical yolk sac tumor, again, I wouldn't uh, put specific immunocytochemistry. Um, but if there's a mixed pattern, if you're thinking of somatic malignancy, immunocytochemistry is definitely, definitely helpful. I think I've come to the end of the questions in the chat group. Anything else if I'm not receiving those, I'm happy to answer those. I think that's the end of it. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.